My name is uh, Gordon LaForge. I am with New America's Planetary Politics Initiative. I used to be an MPA also, so it's, it's quite a pleasure to be back in Bowl 16, not having to think about problem sets and homework requirements. Um, so Planetary Politics is very excited to co-host this panel uh, alongside the School of Public and International Affairs and the Center for Policy uh, Research on Energy and the Environment as well as um, the members of our, of our distinguished panel today from uh, the Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security, and Conflict Transformation, uh, which our panelists will, will talk more about as well. Uh, but the focus of our panel today is climate justice. And um, the, 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 at the heart of the climate challenge for the world is an issue of justice in that the countries that are most uh, least responsible for causing climate change are the ones who are the most impacted by it. Um, so the same is true in the United States, um, where historically marginalized and discriminated communities often live on the front lines of environmental disruption, pollution, um, other harms, and at the same time have fewer resources to be able to adapt. Um, so Policymakers are aware of this. The Biden administration um, has made climate justice a priority in all the funding and the grants that it's putting out. Um, however, there, there is still not, I think, an understanding that this really needs to be a at the core of the issue. Um, so we're very happy today to have our panel to discuss climate justice at home and abroad. Uh, we're very fortunate to have moderating um, Professor Elka Weber. Um, she's Professor of Psychology and Public Affairs and the Gerhard R. R. Andlinger Professor in Energy and the Environment uh, at Princeton. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elka, um, and thank you very much. Thanks so much, Gordon. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our three panelists. Uh, after that, I will uh, ask them some questions. Uh, and then at 10 after or so, we turn it over to the audience uh, for you to uh, propose uh, the questions you want to discuss. So uh, let me start with Malika Glover. <laughs> she is the executive director of WCAPS. Uh, and for the past 20 years, she's been addressing many areas of public health, both domestically and globally. Uh, working for the Center for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, and several other academic institutions. Dr. Glover also has demonstrated record of accomplishments in management, having led uh, task forces, working groups, and teams, implementing new initiatives and engaging in strategic planning. Malika holds a Doctor of Science degree from Harvard's uh, Chan School of Public Health, a Master of Public Health from the University of Michigan School of Public Health, and a Bachelor of Science degree from Clark Atlanta University. Marsha Michelle uh, is an analytic leader and problem solver with 15 plus years of experience in leading teams, managing very large budgets, we're talking 100 to 200 million dollars, uh, building and implementing programs that effectively respond to and prevent natural disasters, and advancing health equity, food security, and nutrition among the most vulnerable. She's worked in West Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and most recently South Asia. Ms. Michelle serves on the board of the International Career Development Program, ICAP. She also volunteers uh, as a mentor and liaison coordinator for WCAPS, which is why she's here today. She currently works as an independent consultant. Uh, in January 2022, uh, she started a presidential leadership scholarship, high-profile partnership program among the presidential centers of the two Bushes, uh, Clinton and Johnson, uh, for leaders with a commitment to help helping solve society's greatest challenges. Most recently, she was selected uh, for the International Career Development Program, ICAP, a professional development and leadership program for highly promising mid-career professionals in international affairs in the United States. Marsha holds a BA from Wheeling Jesuit University in West Virginia and an MA from American University in Washington. Last but not least, Nandini Saxena. Uh, she's a quantitative political analyst, campaign strategist, and researcher based in New York. Her research and advocacy work from past engagements at UNICEF and Yale University have focused on evidence-based behavioral strategies, system thinking, and human-centered design for positive social, environmental, and political initiatives. Nadine is an outreach and engagement coordinator for the Climate Change Working Group at WCAPS. 
She holds a dual bachelor's degree in applied math and statistics with a concentration in, in international relations from Stony Brook and Harvard University. So thank you all for coming. Um, let me, let's start with Malika and yeah, can you maybe tell us a little bit about uh, WCAPS? Uh, how did it come to be? What is it trying to accomplish? Sure, um, thanks for having me, uh, having all of us here. Um, it is a pleasure to partner with you all for this very important discussion and very important topic. Um, and I'll do my short elevator speech for WCAPS. Um, mm -hmm. So WCAPS was started in 2017 by Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins. Um, and fundamentally, the vision of WCAPS is, that, is to advance the leadership and professional development of women, in co women of color um, in the fields of international peace, security, and conflict transformation. And so the organization is a member-based organization, um, and it's set up in a way that allows for a variety of discussions and topics um, in our working groups. We have several um, initiatives that are age-based, um, but also a number of mentorship and pipeline programs to ensure that there is a network and training and really a safe space to have conversations uh, with women of color about important topics such as this. So that's sort of my short version of what WCAS is. Um, you know, we really think of it as a community and a family and a, a space where we can continue to grow and increase the representation of women of color and, and peace and security and conflict. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How large is the group approximately? Uh, there are uh, about 2,000 members. Um, and we always invite um, others to join. Uh, you can join at any time. There's lots of things to be done, and anyone can join. It doesn't have to be just women of color. It can, doesn't have to be women. It could be men, too. We welcome all allies. So maybe say a little bit to any of you so how and why uh, WCAPS works on climate change and climate issues. Well, climate change is one of uh, many critical issues that we're facing, not just in the U.S., but globally. It's critical to um, peace and security, um, to the work that we do, and all of us, and in fact, all of us in this room and those overseas. Um, as a person, as a humanitarian who's worked overseas and worked with refugees and displaced population, um, it's at the core heart of, of the work that I've done. Um, and so yeah, it's, it's, it's critical. Uh, I definitely have found that climate change in particular transfers to different fields. It's not just within what we know as climate change. So it can transfer to healthcare, it can transfer to women and peace building studies, uh, women and gender studies, and it often looks at so many aspects that we wouldn't really see Ukraine had, and it also affects uh, how, how we view ourselves uh, united as a country uh, in terms of um, media disinformation, political polarization, and so many aspects. So I feel like when WCAS works on uh, climate change, we do a service to our adjacent field as well. Yeah, and I would just add that I think in general, um, as part of our mission, again, we feel like you know a global perspective is necessary in these spaces. And part of the conversation about justice is making sure that there's representation of those communities that are most affected, but you know, do the less do less damage, um, and so that's part of our goal to, to make sure that that representation is there. Now you very eloquently talked about why WCAPS is working on this issue. Can you say a little bit from your sort of day-to-day -day experience how you're doing it, what sort of projects you're involved in? Um, part of the work that um, I've been doing on the working group climate change. Um, is educating others and also trying to get more people involved. We've done a series of panel discussions, uh, for example, careers in climate change, right? Um, supporting students and other people who are interested in, in that type of career. And so it's one part of the work that we do. We've wrote papers, right, on climate change, whether it's in Mexico, whether it's the refugees in the Rohingya refugees in Cox Bazaar. Um, and so this is sort of one of the day to day things that we do, educating others, educating ourselves and also sharing the information on how you can become uh, more educated, um, how you can become part of the discussion. Um, and so that's part of the day to day work that I do. Um, when it comes to climate change. 
So in addition, uh, we've been trying to expand our horizons and also invite people to learn more about the inadequacies we face um, in terms of uh, careers in climate change, which I feel like is never addressed usually. Um, there's not enough exposure to what types of careers are available, how you could contribute with your skill sets, um, and also just this awareness of if you're in the public policy field and you're a woman of color or anybody who's underrepresented, how do you find XYZ opportunities? Mm -hmm. Can you really say a little bit more about how professional schools like uh, SPIA could help? So schools like SPIA could help um, in terms of partnership, uh, definitely funneling this sort of initiative to build up not only awareness, but to um, take the people who come from underrepresented backgrounds or anybody who wants to build exposure and just sit down and have this discussion about how would your skill sets be applicable, um, where could you, you know, find something that's to our niche, which we often don't talk about, and it's usually like a very like a one-to-one -one counseling type of thing. So um, there's always unique ways to open doors. Um, I would say um, <coughs> sort of more broadly for WTAX, we uh, are we seek funding for climate change projects. Um, we have one that we are currently um, starting to work on, and also partnering with uh, other other institutions, other programs, other groups, and. So one that, um, in particular, we are partnering with the Indo-Pacific Command in Hawaii to do a documentary on climate change and climate justice in the Pacific Islands. So um, that's just you know one example of some of the programs that we are sort of as a larger organization incorporating um, the working groups and various other working groups and also our chapters um, in in the work that we're doing that focuses on climate justice. Maybe say a little bit more on funding. Where does your funding come from? <laughs> Where could it come from? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, foundations uh, support uh, individual funders. Um, uh, so like Gates Foundation and things like that. So mm -hmm. larger foundations. We also have funding from uh, other organizations who support mentoring programs and want to invest in that aspect of WPACs. Mm -hmm. um, we have a grant like, from Climate Work specifically that is the one that's funding our work on climate justice. So, um, they come from a variety of places in terms of supporting just the general work of WPACs. Um, and also a lot of foundations that are supporting work, you know, focused on DEI and, and things like that who want to increase representation um, of underrepresented uh, communities and, and also women in these spaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could talk a little bit more sort of about the connections between climate change, but then also peace and security. You already mentioned that, you know, but then also sort of, you know, climate justice and, and inequity. And so how do you think all these topics fit together and how can we sort of, you know, make, create be better synergies between advancing on these different fronts? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's, there's numerous ways, I think. So I, my background is, is a social epidemiologist. So sort of having conversations about the intersectionality of all of these things um, is something that uh, I, I talk about and, and think about a lot. But I think fundamentally um, it affects peace and security because if we think about sort of COVID and the impacts of that and sort of what we saw in terms of the disparities, um, it's just another thing that stresses the community that already is economically stressed, social, socially stressed, um, politically stressed. Um, and so you're asking that that community have, be able to bounce back and just absorb another stressor um, that is also a constant stressor that impacts food security and, and, another, and other things that we already mentioned here. And so, I think that it requires um, all various sectors to sort of come to the table and have conversations about how we, what we bring to the table, what resources we bring to the table, and how we can collectively have this conversation. Because I don't think it's any one sort of sector's responsibility to deal with it because it's it's political, it's social, it's economic. You know, um, there are a variety of things to do that. But I think fundamentally, you're you're asking you know already vulnerable populations to to just take on something else without the proper resources to handle it. Uh, sort of like Malika, I've noticed it's definitely a very, um, like a myriad of things all together. Um, so if we don't look, so one of the major things I've looked at is how much um, climate change affects peace and security in terms of the defense front. So in the defense front, that's like, you know, competition for resources and like an another set of issues that just come from one particular thing. So since it's a myriad of problems and they all intersect with each other, things like media disinformation as from the previous experiences, 
or just a lack of uh, support for having proper analytics to derive data. Um, this would tie into how experiences like um, like tie into how um, all of these issues kind of look at it in terms of like a domino effect. So it all it all falls down. So it, that's how it's plays into what she said. Um, when I was asked to talk um, on the panel, I immediately thought of the snow and flooding in California, right? Um, it impacts everyone, but the people we don't talk enough about are farmers, farm workers, right? Um, because most of whom are undocumented. Um, they suffer through extreme heat, drought, and now the flooding. They've lost everything. But because most of them are undocumented, they're not going to receive federal aid. So it doesn't just impact them, but it impacts the food that is being produced um, in the US. So when I think about justice, it's sort of where is justice in that part? Um, um, and when it comes to peace and security, it's funny, I was thinking about the Arab Spring, right? There were multiple multitude of issues that impacted the Arab Spring, right? Um, democracy, human rights, um, and we don't talk enough about the economics, right? People were impacted. For example, Syria, before the war, um, they su suffered from drought for a number of years. Um, over one million people left the countryside to move to the cities because they didn't have enough to eat, they were suffering. And the government never provided support for them. And so this aspect led part of it right, to um, the situation that we have now. It wasn't one, it was a multitude of issues. And so this is where the complexity of climate change comes into, um, into play. And so we have to, we have to think about um, that element of peace and security where these issues with pressure on vulnerable populations, right? Um, in places like the Sahel, when we talk about Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, um, on people who are continuously being displaced um, because of climate change. Thank you. So you already touched upon answers to my next question in, 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 in so many ways. And it, it sounds a bit maybe like Sophie's choice, but yeah, when we can talk about who are the most vulnerable you know, to climate change, maybe both nationally and internationally. And so just bringing back some of the themes. I mean, uh, most vulnerable, we talk about refugees, displaced population. I think by 2015, we'll have um, uh, more than 50 billion people displaced because of climate change. Um, we talk about women, um, children, um, and also people who, who are um, handicapped, right? People um, like that who suffer from it. And I think about sort of um, in the US, sort of um, people in sort of um, black communities, people of color, where we have a lot of sort of factories and industries, right? People in North Carolina have been fighting for so many years, fighting against the poultry and hog industry um, because of the impact of their communities, right? The feces are sprayed into the environment. Um, and so they're fighting for a lot of um, justice in terms of their health, um, the well-being of their community and the, and the environment. So these are the people who are the most impacted and who are continuously being impacted um, by it. Can I look at indigenous communities um, mm -hmm. who rely on the land often um, that is being polluted and you know the soil is being eroded and, and a number of other things and of course um, migrant populations mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, so um, UN Environment uh, has published that 80% of people displaced by climate change issues are women and they face like various types of violence. So that's also seen a recent uptick as well. And then a lot of the communities that are involved in environmental justice also face the same issues that um, Marsha said. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the 
the, the opportunities that you already sort of have been touching on, but maybe also the challenges of bringing together you know, sort of uh, environmental justice and climate change and action on climate change. So maybe from your personal experience, talk a little bit about the challenges and opportunities. <coughs> Um, from my perspective, which is, I guess, public health and, and policy, I think that um, some of the challenges are in sort of siloed, you know, people being siloed. You know, people get protective about their space and, you know, their data. Um, and he was talking about data and, their, and, you know, what it is they're supposed to be an expert in. Um, and they often don't want to make space for conversations for people to um, come into that space. I think on the political side, what I find some of these conversations, again, are siloed conversations, but also when the folks who are at the table um, are not representative of the communities that are being in impacted, then some of that need to sort of, or, or some of that just innate understanding of what's going on and that connection and that desire to be helpful and to resource the conversation is, is absent at times. Um, so I think that there, there are issues with not wanting to sort of cross-pollinate conversation. Um, there are issues with um, lack of inclusivity, um, which, which of course leaves out that sensitive, you know, that, that personal connection to why it's important. Um, and so I find that sometimes you have to sort of figure out a, a different path to having that conversation to get someone to understand why it's important to have this discussion. Um, but that, those are just a, a few of the, the challenges that, that I see, and I think that um, increasing the impact of community organizations, and as Nanini was talking about, just uh, you know the grassroots organizations and the communities that are actually trying to fight these issues, increasing their political power um, and their ability to really sort of be at the table and, and be you know, a significant voice at the table um, would also be helpful too, because the work is happening on the ground. So you know, there's Lots of people talking about it, but action is happening, and they need to be part of those conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like what she said about um, political power. It's a really important issue because, as from my experience uh, in campaign work, uh, the number one problem that, that we faced was uh, pushing agendas. Um, we would often like have this backlash from the conservative community. It was very, it was heavily dominated by the conservative community. Um, which in itself is okay, but um, it didn't lead to you know discussions of this like voluntary movement of bringing people together to engage discussions even further. Um, and then another issue that we would face in terms of the agenda would be what incentives and preferences would work. So if you look on the critical level and how you would you know shift the norms and shift whatever um, practices have been there previously. Um, that we would often face issues with. And another thing, a uh, point that she tapped into was inclusivity of um, opinion uh, and the data that would reflect that. So those are the main issues. Mm -hmm. I would say um, a lot of the issues is making sure that um, the people are most impacted or at the table. And also when it comes to response, responding to the impact of climate change making sure that we're tackling, we're working closely with community organization, communities on the ground, um, and providing faster relief to those who are impacted. Um, because we have all these laws, all, all these agencies, but making sure that our response is quickly, um, faster to those who are impacted by it. Um, and also I think, the Biden administration has been doing it, but investing in infrastructures that are aging, uh, that are breaking down, that are causing more floodings um, and natural disasters in some of these areas. So you're already switching very naturally towards solutions and actions. So let's talk about this a little more explicitly. In addition to you know, sort of making um, initiatives grassroots and, 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 and local and, and inclusivity. What other things could be done you know, to distribute the burdens of, of, of climate change you know, more equitably uh, and to come up with solutions you know, that increase not just our climate preparedness but also you know, equity and justice on all these other dimensions? That's, uh, that's a really good question. And lately I've been thinking about um, the Prime Minister of Barbados who introduced the Bridgetown Initiative um, that would um, sort of give options to 
um, lower countries to get lower interest rate on loans um, from some of the multinational agencies because sort of developing a developed nation like the US can get it between one and four percent, right? But other countries, lower income countries, their loans are at fourteen percent. And these countries are suffering from multitude successive sort of natural disasters, right? And sort of um, because I think we've done this after World War II, right? where we provided room for reconstruction, um, the ability for other countries to rebuild. And so it's sort of that same mentality and that same thinking um, to provide that option to, to low-income countries who've been dealing with some of, of these issues um, and for the lowest emitting emissions, emission countries uh, to do. So on a global level, I think um, the Bridgetown Initiative is something to really be thinking about and how we can get that going. I think it got some attention, um, but not a lot is being pushed right now. Uh, uh, so to answer in two parts, I'm going to talk what Marcia said. Um, on a global level, a really good example of something to distribute burdens and build more equity is focusing on frameworks and models. Uh, so the global development rights is a very good example. I'm sorry, global, I just couldn't hear Global development rights. Um, so how do the countries' pledges compare to each other? What kind of policy do they have that actually have tangible output? You, would, you could see this in um, the pledges that they would make uh, for the climate change agreement that happened in Paris. So that would be on the global scale and on the local scale. Something I noticed in my work personally would be uh, how do you advance different aspects of environmental uh, interventions like health equity and the frameworks that would address that, that especially because if there's no way to allocate and distribute an understanding about what tax you need to do in a certain way, then it's kind of like very disorganized and again the dominant effect from our previous questions. So. Yeah, I would just add, uh, you know, responsible use of resources, um, also equal reinforcement. I mean, you know, we you know, we get to a point where folks are like, well, we have put, you know, uh, laws or whatever on the books to handle, you know, environmental justice or climate change, but they're not equally enforced. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are things that go um, sort of unpunished um, in certain communities. Um, so uh, I think that we need to also focus on increasing, uh, decreasing um, the production or ceasing the production of hazardous waste that we can. Um, in making sure that at all levels of conversation of environmental justice, there are persons from those communities present, and not just some of them. Um, safe, safe work environments, compensation, and of course healthcare, and making sure that we address, uh, you know, in public health, we talked about sort of upstream approaches, and so when it comes to climate justice, it's already in swing, and so you have to address what's happening at the beginning, and also sort of the outcomes of, of the impacts of those things as well. So there needs to be a continuum of, um, of paradigms for which we can address all of those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, it's like a list of you know, sort of legal interventions, uh, but also financial you know, sort of instruments, but then also sort of norm change, right? So you know, changing what is considered acceptable or not acceptable, uh, and, 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 and maybe changing awareness about sort of different other ones. Can you say a little bit about sort of what WCAPS has been trying to do to advance on these different fronts? What has been most successful? Um, I will talk about sort of just more broadly, and then um, I'll let our working group representatives talk about some specific things. More broadly, again, as I mentioned before, sort of our partnering with organizations where we can highlight some of these things where the quote unquote, you know, persons who are not necessarily thought of as the experts um, are the experts because they're living it. They're actually managing it, they're addressing it, they're coming up with solutions for, for their populations and their communities. Um, and so highlighting those women who are working in those spaces to ensure that their voices are actually adequately heard mm -hmm. along with everyone else's um, and that we highlight women who are working in these spaces um, who bring a different perspective and that intersectionality to the table um, at all levels. Um, and so more broadly from that perspective, that is how WCAPS is trying to push this forward. Mm -hmm. So the working group has the climate series uh, featuring different professionals uh, with all the women who were um, contributing to climate in different ways. And that led to 
um, adding different perspectives, which I don't think is a very underrated thing. Um, normally, we don't see how different perspectives can change the status quo um, compared to very old uh, ideas, models, you name it. Um, so the series would give a deeper insight. It's also very revelating, even for somebody like me who's like trying to explore the whole um, political realm. So that's a very big thing that we're working on. No, I think uh, my colleagues stated it all, especially we focus on educating um, others and sharing the information on, on the work that we do. So you work with policymakers at all different levels, you know, both nationally and internationally. What kind of advice would you give those who are trying to make headway on climate change and on climate justice? Don't give up. <laughs> 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 it's a struggle. Uh, like everything else, I swear. Um, yeah, I don't give up. I mean, I know people sort of, there's so many barriers and things and people sort of just get frustrated and they want to quit. Um, I would say don't do it alone. You know, you need, you need support. You know, you need people who are in the fight with you. Um, and always incorporate rest. That is like my theme from now on. You know, this year is trying to incorporate rest. So take pauses and you know, don't try to like push through sometimes. Sometimes you need to take a step back and um, recalibrate and think if there's a different approach um, that maybe you need to take because you're kind of butting your head against somebody politically, for example, and they're not trying to hear it. Um, so sometimes you just have to come up with alternative strategies to like shift, either throw them off balance or, you know, sort of just get it from a different angle and still end up with the same outcome that you were looking for. Um, but I would definitely say don't go it alone, don't give up, and um, be mindful of your own justice and, and peace as well as you're, as you're fighting the good fight. And um, I, I infiltrate as many spaces as possible <laughs> <laughs> um, so that we can start shifting the voice and the thought and the norms. Um, and I think that's only the real way to do it. We can't just wait for people to die off. Um, hanging on. <laughs> so I think that you know we need to really sort of get in these spaces and be heard and then start to shift the dynamic and the thinking a little bit. I like the creative subversion. Yes. Well, she said was perfect. Absolutely. <laughs> um, as someone who has worked um, most of my career overseas, I would say being open-minded. Because sometimes we think when we're coming from the US or any Western world that we have the solution. And it's not always true. The solution is there. They may not have the funding to do the biggest innovative technologies, right? I mean, I've worked in Niger and they've been doing this, what is called this moon, right? Um, doing the lean season um, for when it rains, they capture the water in the ground so they can continue planting, right? I mean, they don't have the funding to invest in some of the climate solutions, right? And so being open-minded that they have their own solutions, they may not have uh, the funding, and so being open-minded. And also the struggles in terms of funding, because as a humanitarian, we didn't think, there, there used to be sort of, I would say clashes, but, um, between the development group and the humanitarian sort of whose role is it to work in that space, right? Um, and now we're seeing, well, there is that collaboration. It's not just the development issue. It's a humanitarian issue. It's all of issues. So there is definitely strength in collaborating, right, in coming together, in bringing the short term with humanitarian relief and sort of including the development side for the longer, longer term solutions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And looking for allies in these other camps. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And this notion, you know, humanitarian aid has to fall in one person. Yeah. You know, we're all human. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so again, you know, I think we really just need to shift the norms of really focusing on like just being respectful to all humans. Mm -hmm. And they all deserve, you know, fresh air, clean water and very basic to survive. Mm -hmm. so, what about other other uh, agents, uh, stakeholders, uh, corporations? What can corporations do? What should should be doing? Stop the meeting. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, and hold people accountable for it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, especially if they're funding these, yeah. you know, these, these 
factories or whatever it is. Investing in technologies that would help us reduce pollution, right? To do things better. Um, I think that's one option. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think your example, um, I think also investing in grassroots community options that don't require a lot of technology. Maybe everything is not highly technical. Maybe they're very simple traditional solutions for things that um, just might require a little extra assistance or to get everybody on board. So I think corporations need to help with that too. Mm -hmm. And then maybe lastly, NGOs, uh, universities, uh, researchers, scientists, social scientists, what should they need be doing? This. Having <laughs> 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 conversations and discussions and partnering and giving each other support and um, feeding our pipeline to infiltrating these spaces, mm -hmm. uh, universities, of course. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I would definitely say um, more funding is required um, for more thorough, deeper you know, research. A lot of people, and, and something in my personal experience I've faced is that when we don't, when we come from underrepresented communities, we often face the struggle of, you know, acquiring education, acquiring opportunities. So the, the brain power and um, the different dynamic perspective that somebody from a background of struggle would come with to change the status quo is often just not at the table. Um, so I would say accessibility is number one. Um, that would definitely in the academia and like the research uh, portion would be most optimal. I'm going to dive up like this conversation, um, sharing the information. Um, on all platforms, making sure it's available to everyone, uh, especially those communities who are impacted as well. Um, making sure that those who are not at the table or invited uh, participate. Um, yeah. So maybe now we can open the floor to members of the audience. Uh, we have two microphones, and so those of you who want to ask a question, move to one of the microphones and maybe say who you are. Uh, and then ask your question to our panelists. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll hold it this way. Hi, uh, so I'm Anne Marie Slaughter. I'm the CEO of New America and the former dean here at SPIA. And I'm thrilled to see uh, this panel. And it's exactly the many more of these conversations in schools like this one. I want to ask how you approach the situations that we, and I include myself in this we, encounter all the time uh, in DC. And what kind of very practical advice you would give in a situation in which, so you have the top national security officials around you. There's the president, there's Jake Sullivan, there's John Finer, there's Tony Blinken. I hope you notice a pattern here. Um, and they are going to all talk your talk, but look at who, who they are. And you know they are spending 80% of their time on Ukraine or on China. And that's generous. So, but they've written a national security strategy, and I really think it is a historic document, actually written by Tom Wright, who is a graduate here, um, that says global problems, climate change, Pandemics, food insecurity, water insecurity, energy shortages are just as important as those geopolitical issues. And yet they're spending 80 plus percent of their time. How, you can't just go in and tell them they're wrong. I've tried. <laughs> it really doesn't, doesn't work very well. How do you tailor your message in that situation? And then additionally, so now you're Avril Haines, or maybe you're going to be Michelle. Uh, Flournoy at some point, or Lloyd Austin probably experiences this as well. You've only gotten to where you are because you played that game. If you had been, if you had taken the line that you've taken, many of us take, you wouldn't be in those positions. So how do you adapt to the existing power structure? And I get you, don't give up and take plenty of rest. And I'm with you 100%. But really, for, for people in this room, I mean, that's, they come, that's what it comes down to. How do you push? without alienating or basically getting yourself excluded, which is what de facto happens. What a tough question. <laughs> I think I've stayed away from Washington for a long time, and I thought I would be most effective being overseas. 
and working on humanitarian issues like refugees and IDPs. Um, but then again, we have to continue with the policy work. The policy work is as important as the work that, as the work that we do on the ground, right? Um, so we have to continue pushing. And so that's why I think it's really important to invest in groups like WCAPs or groups that are fighting for climate change, for all of these issues that continue to not be at the top. Um, I worked on humanitarian issues and it's always a fight writing the strategies, making sure, because all of us were fighting for our region. I was fighting for the Varinjas to have money to provide food. Um, it's hard to compete with a situation like U Ukraine. We're never going to win that, that battle because it's Russia and all these things. But I think we have to continue to find ways to push Washington. I mean, um, in 2021, I guess the Biden administration put together an order on sort of elevating the issue of climate change, which is great, right? But we need more concrete actions. And so I think that's where smaller groups like WCAPs or NGOs, think tanks and policymakers, right? Working in the policy arena um, need to work more in sort of continuing to push, elevate the issues, but also bring, bringing the issues of um, groups like uh, black communities in North Carolina who are fighting the hog industry and fighting concrete action. I mean, I don't definitely don't have the answer, and I think it's it's really really hard. But we we need hope, right? We need hope to continue to push on these issues. So I have hope, but it's hard. It's really really hard. To um, um, to see uh, not see these issues left elevated as much, but we have to continue doing the work that it requires. Yeah. Um, so that is a very loaded question, <laughs> uh, but I think one of the most important ones, um, because in all my experiences, they were small. It's um, I've always faced that issue, um, and I think it's like a very critical part of the discussion, which we don't have. But one of the reasons why I like love Dublin Caps from the bottom of my heart is the fact that they gave somebody who's like me, a person who doesn't have that much representation in the program, to step forth and you know take all the skills I've harnessed from my life and work on applying it, whether it be the soft skills or the hard skills, it doesn't really matter. I do think groups like this push for the dynamic to change. Mm -hmm. um, it requires for very large power structures, I like the ones you just mentioned in DC. It's like a lot of the groups that are aid and acting some sort of change uh, be, would be to implement more persuasion techniques. I think that is very underestimated. Um, and, you know, C would be the strength and unity plus taking rest, like whatever um, Malika said. So all together, it's like, you know, little steps each way, but it'll, you know, change the rhythm completely at some point. Yeah, and I would say voice. I mean, we have to continue to have a voice, and so this changing of the media, you know, the media is important, which is why the focus is so much in one place, because that's all the media is talking about. Yeah. Um, so I think the media is important. Um, and then also, you know, the, the alternative strategies. I think you have, to, you have to figure out how to bring this to the doorstep of the people that we need to sort of adjust their thinking. You know, we've had scenarios in public health, for example, where, you know, we couldn't get attention to cancer or a disease until it impacted somebody's son in Congress. You know, and then it's like, oh, okay, you know, cancer's important now because it's actually in my house. So I think that that whole sort of media approach, making sure our voice is heard and keeping that energy going, but also sort of these alternative strategies of figuring out how to say, this is going to show up at your doorstep at some point. Yeah. Um, and so it would be better if you address this now. Um, and have some resources, you know, flowing in that direction or figuring out a, a path to, to adjust, address that. That seems to sort of push the political envelope a little bit sometimes. And it, it's slow going. I think that's the other thing. I think it requires a little patience. Um, but I think the more that we sort of invest in changing the look and the appearance and the voice of the folks in the conversation, and the more we continue to have these conversations and show up, you know, in numbers, I think, you know, we'll, we'll start to see the that change. It may take some time. <laughs> <laughs> and Marie, do you want to add your wisdom on what to do? Oh, yeah, good, good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
I'm not that bad. I'm just enjoying being on this side of the podium, right? <laughs> I get to ask the question, not the, not the answers. I mean, I, I think, so I think, I do think persuasion, not, let me back up a second. It's human nature to focus on what is closest to us. We all do that. Uh, and ultimately, though, as a government, you have a responsibility not to do that. You are representing all the people, or you, or you uh, that's what you should be doing. Uh, but I, I think it is important to go in assuming that, in fact, uh, there is sort of positive intent. That's part of persuasion, right? If you go in and assume, you know, you're, you're, you're it's a brick wall, and they, they really don't care, and they're hypocrites, and they say this thing, and, but, and they, but they don't mean it. As opposed to, yeah, they, look, these are, these are young men, young white men, not so young <laughs> in some cases, but in others, who are socialized in a particular way uh, to make it in foreign policy. It's guns and bombs. I mean, I, I, one of my most formative moments was at Harvard in the 80s watching Condi Rice talk arms control at Sam Huntington seminar. So you want to talk about a white male environment. There were very few women, and she's certainly the only person of color. And to, you know, she, to make it, she had to be completely fluent in nuclear weapons speak. Um, that happens for everyone. So I think if you, uh, but you, uh, you assume Yes, if you can make the point, to your point, you know, this is in your interest. This is in your political interest. This is in your, your uh, direct interest as a, as a human being. You won't get all the way there, but you shouldn't discount it. Uh, we're so used to throwing insults at one another in DC that, that the value of persuasion, I think, I think is right. Um, persistence and then, um, you know, what I, what I work on is not just getting representatives to the table, but a critical mass. And that's true in my own organization. If you have one woman, two women, a couple people of color, there you know, no one's gonna be the person who sort of sticks their neck out and gets ostracized. If you can get to 30, 35 percent, suddenly things really start to change. And so figuring out, you know, what is your coalition how do you bring those folks into the room, and how and who are your allies, particularly like in on on the Hill now, and in lots of offices uh, in the government, not at the very top, but lower. You've got allies, and how you work through work through that. And I would absolutely uh, stress what Mal Malika said: that <laughs> rests persistence, but recognizing it's just it's really hard work. Um, and I. I, I really do take off my, my hat to Bonnie Jenkins, to Ambassador Jenkins, and who's back in government wonderfully, but for, for creating. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? I'm going to pass the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you so much for the presentation and the discussion and for those of you that brought to this panel here. It's much appreciated. Um, my name is Devin Brookins. I'm a lecturer here at SPIA, um, and I teach in the international development and urban space. Um, and recently, I've gotten um, much more into climate-related work. So I have two questions. Um, the first one, sort of to, like linking the, the domestic to the global. I think just the way that we frame, frame talking about climate change is very different in both spaces. Most of my work is in sub-Saharan Africa, and so we're talking about the impacts of climate change increasing resilience, adaptation, mitigation, et cetera. But in the domestic space, the, the conversation is slightly different. It's much more focused on mitigation, carbon, and the EJ conversation, environmental justice. Um, and so you, I'm very curious to think about how can you link the domestic and international narratives? So what kind of messaging do you use to show that these are completely related conversations and that you have justice implications globally? So one, obviously, is the migration issue that was brought up. Um, but you know, there's so many other ways that sort of marginalized populations find themselves um, having justice concerns globally. So, for instance, um, my work is in, in Ghana, and informal settlements in the, in the capital city and other cities are always located on tenuous land regimes. So these people are facing um, certain struggles because of climate change. Um, they cannot access any kind of uh, mediation because they're not recognized as legal communities. So there are marginalized populations everywhere. How do we sort of link these narratives? And not just because it's, you know, there's a sort of intellectual desire to do it, but because 
the sort of need or impetus to, to stoke and link grassroots movements is really important. One of the ways to increase voice is to help link people across spaces. Um, and that sort of links to sort of like very local grassroots to the much larger, like the, the greens, as Dorset of Taylor, the, the, the big greens, as Dorset of Taylor calls it, the Audubon, Sierra, Greenpeace, etc. There's huge power there. And so how do we link these like very local struggles with global struggles? And then I have a second question just to push a little bit on uh, Dr. Robert's statement about justice and issue distribution. Um, so I actually did a talk uh, this week about environmental justice in Camden, New Jersey. And I'm from uh, Camden County. I grew up in the suburbs there. And in doing the research for um, uh, uh, an ongoing research project, I started to find out the waste systems um, and how they're connected. Um, so the waste is produced in uh, more higher income areas, like my neighborhood, uh, where he used Cherry Hill, New Jersey, actually gets taken to uh, Camden uh, for it to be processed. And so there's an issue of the distri distribution, not just of the cost, but also the benefits. So when we're talking about justice, how do we think about this like politics of distribution? Because some, at some point, we have to have a conversation about removing some of the burden from these communities, and then where does it go? Um, you know, figuring out uh, prevention, like pollution prevention strategies is absolutely part of that conversation. But there's also an immediate question of, you know, how can we look at? And this is a very multi-scalar issue from the city, government, county, state, on up to the federal level. So how would you think? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna, there's three of us, I, I, I'm gonna let all of us talk. I mean, we all probably have a different perspective. I feel like I'm gonna take like a little bit of both of those things. Um, so there's an activist um, that was asked in an interview, um, how would she define freedom? Um, and her reply was that she knew more about what freedom was it than what it was. And so I would say the same thing for justice. I know more about what justice is not than what I think this world has demonstrated that it is. Um, and so from that perspective, to answer that first portion of your question, I think that's, that's part of the strategy to keep this going and to keep it divided. By demonstrating that there's not a difference between what's happening domestically and internationally because it's inextricably tied together. It's all minority communities, marginalized communities, communities have been traditionally not recognized, whatever that means, they're all people, I don't know how you not recognize humans. Um, but I think that's a political strategy that needs to be addressed, and I think that that's part of keeping the resources separate as well and, and not really moving forward in that space. That's my personal opinion about why it's hard to have those discussions. And again, back to silo. You want to call it environmental justice in the U.S. and it's climate change, when it's international, it's all the same conversation at, at fundamentally at base. Um, but again, then somebody can claim to be an expert in this space versus this space, and so I think it's all part of why we need to just stop that and I'll figure out how to get to the table together and come up with solutions instead of just talking about what's going on. Um, I think the other piece about what you're saying, I think that still ties into that other question about how we then have a conversation about equ equitable distribution. Because I think that we have to sort of change our mindset to rethink the fact that how did these things get inequitable in the first place? How do we make decisions that it should be in Camden versus another county versus you know, another community that was, um, you know, a, a higher socioeconomic status or whatever the case may be. I'm sure we could all have people represented from those youth groups that can come to the table and have a conversation about where does it make sense to put this, um, really. And if it doesn't really make sense, then there's nowhere safe to put it because it's going to be disruptive to everybody, no matter what your socioeconomic status is, then we need another alternative to this problem. And so, again, that's where we're having conversations about more upstream solutions versus let's just move from this neighborhood to this neighborhood and this neighborhood or to this island. You know, we've done nuclear testing on islands and those people are still dealing and their children and their grandchildren are still dealing when we sort of, you know, put tapes on it by giving them money and sort of making them half citizens and, and all kinds of strange things. Um, so again, I think those are just my two comments. I think that we need to shift the conversation um, and not feel the need to make, get, put different titles on it and just have a, a more inclusive discussion and also you know, again, if there's no right answer to where we need to move it, then we need to have a different conversation from that perspective as well. I might not have addressed all of that, <laughs> but that's my little answer. Um, so similarly, similarly to what she's saying, um, on a global level, I definitely think that since all humans are the same, the innovative strategies approaches, something that takes a humanistic aspect into it is the reason why global and 
uh, domestic uh, policy work in general and like solutions and all that is interlinked to each other. And then on the local level, the same like um, socioeconomic disparity issue is something I saw in my campaign work where finding the middle ground was possibly like the only solution we had. Um, and that is a very tough to, thing to do because it requires you to bring people to the table and then to really effectively address what the issues are, why does the inequality exist to begin with. So it's like, again, the myriad of problems that goes in my domino effect, like I keep rephrasing. So um, yeah, they're all very complex, but it's all intertwined. Uh, I think for a long time we thought we were the exception, like certain problems overseas didn't impact us. While it was happening in a lot of lower income countries, um, recently I read an article in the New York Times talking about climate refugees, people from California moving to other places like Minnesota to escape uh, the wildfires, right? Um, and they were talking about this family who moved and their families moved um, and now have a great life in Minnesota. They bought properties because it was so cheap in this dying town in Minnesota and things like that. And it was interesting to sort of refer to them as refugees, right? Because they voluntarily moved. They left a situation that was getting more complicated and, and I thought of Katrina in 2005, mm -hmm. right? There were over a thousand deaths and people were just forced to leave because they couldn't go back. Um, and so I think when we start really thinking about these issues, right? It's like gentrification, right? There's no money to invest in poor communities and suddenly gentrification happens and we're building new property, buses are, you know, happening, new routes and, and things like that. And so finding solutions to things like this require intentionality, right? That minority um, ethnic groups are not the dumping ground for toxic waste. Um, I think and when we think that climate change impacts all of us, not just a few, some of us might have more resources to deal with it, right? To move, um, to buy new technologies, but I think um, forcing change requires intentionality and investing for us to do things differently. Because it's easy, right? We go to uh, a smaller community, they don't have the resources, they don't have the media attention, um, and so we just do it. And there are communities who've been fighting it for a long time. And so for me, climate change um, impacts all of us. Um, I think here there's been a, a real focus on the justice, environmental justice, because for a long time, that's what we've done. We dumped it into black communities and things like that. Um, and so thinking about different ways um, of doing things, investing in innovation and technology so that these communities are not the dumping ground. And also making sure that we're elevating their voices, right? Because there's not the meeting and attention, bringing those issues to the forefront to policymakers to make sure it changes. I think a great book that I read that I read part of it that brought perspective is Dumping in Dixie. It's really, really good. Um, his last name is, he's, he's, I think, referred as to the father of environmental justice. Oh, Lord. But, but yes. Yeah. Um, and sort of really, really good book. Mm -hmm. And I would say shifting norms, you were talking about sort of thought norms. Is it really appropriate to, to call the community that had to move because of wildfires refugees? So I think there's a lot of political norms that that caught that continue this notion um, and just keep it going and support it. And I, and, I, and I think also one of the issues with this where do we move it? There's also this notion that somebody's got to lose in this situation, and I think that also keeps the balance shifted, you know, inappropriately in the in the direction of always you know having these problems in minority communities because the other communities are certainly not going to raise their hand to lose. So I think that if we sort of shift the, also our thinking in these discussions um, where there's a lot of sort of this American notion of keeping things the way that they have been because of how America was created, 
that's a huge shift that needs to happen. And I think until we do that, we're going to continue to look at these things, I think, from the wrong lens. Um, because we're coming from a place of scarcity and I don't want to lose and I can't be at the bottom and I don't want to be that group. You know, I don't want them replacing us. So I think all of those conversations are, are going to continue to land us back in the same spot until we, can, until we shift the lens that we're having these, these conversations from. So we have probably half hour, but it's just like another quick question, comment. Can you see that, please? Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for sharing your wisdom and brilliance. Um, I have a quick question. Can you like recall a really particularly dynamic or innovative like community mobilization or effort to address climate change that really like uh, envelops like community like a really localized level? And I say that because um, I am an MPP student here, uh, studying policy. And I when I think about my journey here. Uh, I referenced in my application, but thinking about how natural hair movements in the United States have culminated with like the Crown Act. So mm -hmm. like there was this community swell of like black women saying, I refuse <laughs> to damage my hair. I'm proud of my, my sense of self and how that um, through like cultural production and like technology has led to this sort of like policy initiative to ensure that black women have dignity and power within the workplace. And I'm thinking like, is there something like that in the climate space? Uh, that's been like dynamic and innovative and like captured people so that folks like me who are community centered can like reference. Thank you. There, there's a documentary on PBS that I can think about. The, they, uh, it was the sort of the stroke belt, I think, that they did a documentary on. And I think this gentleman who wrote that book that Marsha was talking about was also part of that, that documentary as well. And I think if you just Google climate justice and PBS special or something, you'll, you'll find it. But they, they talked about sort of innovative ways to address some of these issues. But it was, it was mainly focused on innovative, innovative ways for the community to deal with it. Um, but also how to address it politically. So for example, when you're talking about sort of like the drought and sort of the erosion of the soil and things like that, then there are, there are indigenous communities that then also made it a point to bring back seeds that will survive in those, in that, in that new sort of soil, in that new sort of like water restricted space and those sorts of things. And so they are selling these seeds to the community and sharing them and giving them away so that they can continue to grow the crops and feed themselves. Um, so I think that it's two-sided. It's how do we continue to sort of help ourselves and also sort of how do we spotlight these things so we can continue to make political change and put this in front of somebody who can address the fact that this factory is polluting our neighborhood, it's creating erosion, it's flooding our communities, which means people don't have housing, they have to leave, all kinds of things have to happen. But I thought that that, it was like a five or six sort of video series and I thought it was kind of cool to kind of talk about both, both aspects of that. So this is clearly a conversation that needs to be continued and will be continued. Unfortunately, not right now. We have about <laughs> one and a half hour. So I want to thank our panelists you know, so much for coming. And sharing with us. And thank you for doing all this important work. And then also for New America and for CPRI uh, and SPIA sponsoring this event. So and the audience members for being here. Yeah. Thank you.